I did have, oh, the last thing, pretty important, by the way, is this is our last Bible study till like September 20 something or other, yeah. I think I get back to 20th, we kick off the book of Judges on September 27th, yeah. Okay, but let's go ahead and jump in. Um, I, I'll try to make this a quick story, but I was on the beach. Uh, you know the guy that does the funny workout at the beach, the yoga guy? I don't know, whatever. So I went up and I was checking the surf and he was doing his yoga thing. And he comes up and he kind of accosts me a little bit. What are you waiting for? I think he has, I think he's Egyptian. He sounds like he has an Egyptian. What is it? Mule, because he's Moroccan. He's Moroccan. Okay, well, I was close. North, North Africa, I had the right region. What are you waiting for? You should go surf. What are you waiting for? Go participate. And all I'm thinking is, bro, I've been surfing almost 48 years. <laughs> you don't think I don't know what is going on and my decision-making process about whether or not to surf is so far beyond what you're thinking right now. But then he launched into the mumbo jumbo and I don't even remember exactly what it was, but he launched into some spiritual thing. You see the body and the mind and the spirit and I just, my eyes rolled back and I was like, and here's why. I don't mean to be super cynical. I'm looking at Charlie, I know he can relate. Greg, <laughs> Steve, yeah. If you grew up in California in the 70s like me, oh my gosh, we got earfuls. Uh, there's a song by the Grateful Dead called Estimated Prophet. And it's, it's a mockery of all the self-proclaimed and self-appointed gurus that quickly wanted to tell you what was going on spiritually. And then I've discovered, since, you know, if I mention I'm a pastor, oh man, do people want to launch into, let me tell you, let me tell you how it really is. And they want to launch into this. And they'll usually include the Bible as, oh, the Bible, but that's just part of it and da, da, da. Well, you know what? I didn't say it to this guy, but it kind of bugged me and I just kind of ignored him and he went away. But I got to thinking, man, you know, after How last week's... Go away? What's that? How did you get him to go away? Ignored him. <laughs> I oh, I said, no, I said, have a great workout. Yeah. And then he was like, oh, okay. And then he went and did his workout. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but uh, last week I thought this is the best, like if anybody says anything to me, I'm just going to say this. Um, or is it, was it last week? Do you acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is from God? Because <laughs> if they, they say anything other than yes, right? Then I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, according to the Bible, you're a false prophet and the Bible is where it was my wisdom. So I'm sorry, I can't listen to you. You're a, isn't that great? It's so simple. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. End of story. It's so simple. So, How come you didn't say that? What's that? How come you didn't say that to the guy? I, I didn't think about it until after I r rode my bike. And I wasn't on my bike. He was on his bike. I was driving away and I was like, you know, <laughs> the book of John has just made it really simple. Like, yeah, if you're, if you, you, anyways, isn't that cool? Um, I'm going to really kind of blow through the review because I think everybody's got it kind of down. The most thing, the most important thing is the context that this letter is written in a response to the Gnostics who were uh, persuading persuasively the Christians away from orthodoxy by encouraging them that sin either A, didn't exist or B, if there was such a thing, it didn't matter because spirit and material uh, and physicality and material world where it's two separate worlds and so you could do what you wanted, okay? And so, tonight um, is the summary, sort of, um, at, the end, at the end of the book, uh, and he's gonna begin with three basic elements of how he wants us to walk. So chapter five, verse one, everyone who believes that, that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. So, um, by the way, um, I should have maybe thought about this with, what is his name? Marouk from Morocco? I, I can't, oh, Mule, is it Mule? Mule. Mule from Morocco, yeah. But I, I want to share a brief story with you. It's a simple test as well. And I learned this from Gary Stack, because Gary Stack, for those of you that don't know who Gary Stack is, um, he was one of our elders here of the church, but he was also a, he and his wife Nancy were both um, uh, professional Christian counselors and apparently really good at it too from what I heard but one of the first things he would ask people when they came in for Christian counseling is are you a Christian 
right? But that's not actually how he would phrase it, because I asked him one time. He goes, well, listen, nobody can really know the heart of a man or a woman, whether they're saved or not. But I use this very simple test. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God come to earth for the forgiveness of sins, and is he your personal Savior? And he goes, if anybody responded anything other than yes, <laughs> he goes, then I knew at least probably where they were at. Because he said most people wouldn't say no. They would say, well, I believe in God and that Jesus is blah, 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 right? Or what's one of the other ones? Um, I'm a very spiritual person, right? Or, or you like this one? Well, I think those are my personal private beliefs, right? Any of those answers, eh. man, if you were born, born, <laughs> saved by the blood of Christ, born again, baptized, Bible-believing believer, and somebody asks you, like, if you that, yeah, what's the simple answer? Yes, hello, of course, Jesus Christ is my Savior. Okay, right? So, um, so according to the, um, the um, commentator Barker, by the way, I thought he wrote some great stuff. I'm going to be quoting from him a lot tonight. Um, he says, this verse that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well is not like a spiritual litmus test. Listen, listen to what he says. This is not the quote-unquote method of getting saved, but this statement is the outcome of already being born again. Those who are born again will testify that Jesus is the Christ. I thought that was well, well said, so I, I, I wrote down the quote. And if God is your father right? Then straight logic and math is you will love your family, right? So, and everyone who loves the father loves his child as well, which once again, to Steve Farrell's point is why we need to be in church. Because let's be honest, even if your family drives you nuts, like they do, right? <laughs> They're still your family, whether you like them or not. Great advertisement for church, isn't it? Okay. Uh, verses two to four. And this is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Okay, let me unpack this a little bit. Um, at first glance, it appears a little confusing. Like, did he mean to say, this is how we know we love God? No, he's simply saying this. This is the converse of if, um, you, if you love God, you love his children. He's basically saying, um, just as you can't love God without loving his children, so you cannot love his children if you don't love him. Now that seems a little bit like, wait a minute, but don't I love my kids even before I was a Christian? Or don't I, can't I love people even if I'm not a Christian? My response to that is, you might love them, but not with the same kind of love with which God loves us. Let me explain that. <laughs> I, think, I think I understand the concept. We talked about this last week, that the love of the Trinity, which is the love between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, is a holy love. It's an other type of love. It's different than everything else that is happening around here on the planet, even though we love our kids and da-da-da-da. Their love is a very special kind of love. Upon our salvation, we are invited into relationship and into that loving relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And our response to being invited into that relationship is to love others the way God loves us. And so basically this math that John is doing here is to say, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, then you'll love his children as well with this special love. And likewise, this special love reveals that you love God. Did I say that right? It's a bit of a tongue twister, a bit of a brain meld, but I spent probably too much time trying to figure that out today. Yeah. And the key, and how we know, of course, is in obedience, obeying his commands. Now, that's interesting because, oh, how do we know? Well, we obey his commands. And I wrote in my notes, parentheses, which sounds burdensome, right? But that's not really true, okay? It, it depends on 
what your view of obedience to God means in your head. Because, yeah, perspective, because it is our obedience which leads to overcoming the world. So let me take, let me just before you raise your hand or anything, let me just explain. First of all, I want to read this quote from Glenn Barker. To the natural man, that means the unsaved man, the will of God is strange and the requirement for righteousness foreign and hard. Even the law of love is a burden. But when God has entered into us and when we trust God's son, then his yoke becomes gentle and the burden light. We who have been born of God have within us a desire and a yearning for the Father. Seeking and hungering after righteousness becomes our joy. Living the life of love becomes our delight. The commands of God bring us the freedom and the liberty we so heartily long for. Now that doesn't mean it's going to be easy either, right? But it shouldn't become a drudgery and a burden. And so here's an example that I came up with. It took a while for many of us, and me especially, to understand that being obedient to God is the way to the eternal life that he has for me, that brings about joy. Um, and that, oh, um, wait, how did I, I got mixed up in my, a pro, oh, a progression. Oh, sorry, I got, I'm reading from the wrong line. Okay. Um, okay, it leads to life. And even if it's hard, or especially, here's one of the keys especially if it doesn't bring us instant gratification or instant happiness. We think we need to be happy now, but joy is sometimes the long road. Joy comes from the long road of obedience. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then I think what happens is as you gain maturity in your faith and you become more practiced, at living this life of love and obedience to God, you begin to see its fruit and you begin to understand why it can't be considered a burden. Does that make sense? What a real burden is, is sin. <laughs> because sin entangles and sin oppresses. And it just really does. And then you begin to see that the obedient life leads to um, a free conscience, yeah? an understanding of what real living is and what life is. And sin is what seems to become the burden. Did that make sense? Okay, okay. Let me just read this last verse, verse five. And then if you guys wanna uh, jump in, uh, this is kind of just the summary of that section. Verse five says, who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. So this is interesting because he started the section with belief, everyone who believes that Jesus is born of God, and he ends with this idea of belief. Only he who believes that, um, who overcomes is he who believes. So to overcome in the Greek means to conquer or prevail over. And by the way, a couple commentators went way down that bunny hole. They went down, um, the, uh, the book of Revelation has a whole list of promises to those who overcome, like to all the individual churches, to those who overcome the world, you will eat of the tree of life. They will, those who overcome will never die. Those who overcome will be given a new name. Those who overcome will enjoy the hidden mana. Those who overcome will wear a white robe. Those who overcome will have a place in his book. All these awesome things that when you overcome um, the world, and the cool thing is you get all of that simply for believing that Jesus is the son of God, the come, the Messiah who has come. So anyways, pretty, pretty booming um, promises there. Okay. Water and blood. Uh, this wasn't super complicated, but it's a little interesting. Okay. Verses six through nine. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Let's just pause right there. Okay, um, water and blood is a basic concept. 
However, <laughs> these verses have been greatly argued about over um, throughout history. Um, St. Augustine linked these verses directly to John 1934, that when they pierce the side of Jesus, what comes out? And blood, water and blood, right? Calvin and Luther, in doing their high church thing, connected it to, John's, uh, to John chapters 4 and 5 and connect it to the sacraments, yeah? John 4 and 5 is all about the blood of Christ and the bread, um, the bread. And so they dragged all that in. However, others saw in it the Old Testament sacrifice, sacrificial symbolism of water purity rites. Because remember, water purity rites were a big deal when we went through Leviticus. They had to purify themselves with water. And then obviously um, the um, animal blood sacrifice. However, these days, most people are in agreement that this is more linked to his baptism and the blood that he shed on the cross. How much all of that really matters, I don't know if you care, but I thought I would give you some background on what has been um, discussed before. Uh, by the way, some of you might have in your notes, in some translation, it uses the word. Uh, for there are three that testify the, wor um, the spirit, the word, and the blood. Don't ask me why no, i'm sorry i think i got it wrong late manuscripts of the vulgate testify in heaven the father the word and the holy spirit these three are one and they, they think that was added later um to give a proof of the trinity that makes sense um, but the earliest versions don't have that they actually have spirit water and blood if you care okay so um uh, the Spirit testifies because man cannot testify with 100% truth because of sin. And uh, this likely uh, is related back to the Holy Spirit at Christ's baptism. The Spirit comes when, when the baptism takes place, which is the water. And as you're also probably aware, um, all through the Bible, the Spirit is sort of referred to in the context of water. Okay. Um, and then in the, this is kind of cool, in the present tense in the Greek, it shows that the Spirit is moving continuously in his witness to the community of believers. In other words, it's not written like, and the Spirit testified at that time, but the Spirit is continually testifying to us in our hearts. It is the Spirit of truth constantly leading us into truth. Now, verse 7 has an interesting side note. Um, where, let's read verse 7 first. Um, for there are three that testify the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And if I read from the NIV notes, um, other versions, uh, and there are three that testify on the earth that are, oh, all that, I'm sorry, this, I got myself confused. That was what I meant to say about the earlier versions from the 16th. There's no version before the 16th century that includes the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Sorry, I confused that. I went back to that first point. I thought it was two different points. It was actually one main point. The last part about this little section I thought was interesting. Um, it doesn't really say it in here. It says we do accept, you know, we, we accept man's testimony, but... God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God. And it reminded me um, of Jesus saying, also in John's first writing in the Gospel of John, um, Jesus says, you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. <laughs> I just love that Jesus is like, look, not that I accept man's testimony because i'm god and when the spirit testifies oh yeah i take his testimony because it's perfect um by the way i thought about this today so i went and looked it up to make sure that this wasn't just um biblical conventional wisdom but i went and looked it up you know at the time that jesus said that not that i accept human testimony which by the way now that i think about it that's from the new niv I will bet you what Jesus actually said was not that I accept man's testimony, which is important to my point I'm about to make. I went and looked it up today, and sure enough, you know, at that time when Jesus was walking around, did you know women were not allowed to testify in court? 
which just kind of chaps my grits a little bit like that, yeah? Which is also why I always like to bring that up, how awesome it is that the first people to see, the first people that heard the testimony that Christ had risen from the dead, from Christ himself and from angels, or depending on how you view those verses, went to women. I just love that. And so I love the fact that Jesus says to these guys, not that I accept man's testimony. <laughs> Now, I don't know if he was saying that as a dig, but I see the historical humor behind that. Way to go, Jesus. Okay, so uh, verses 10 to 12. The fact of the matter is, verses 10 to 12, anyone who believes in... Oh, I love this. These are the classic lines. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in his heart. Because who do we have in our heart? The Holy Spirit, baby, as a seal of our... Um, what is it? Ephesians 1, as they seal, deposit, the seal of our inheritance, the deposit of our inheritance. Yeah. Sealed as a deposit on our inheritance. Sorry. Uh, in his heart, anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And I love this. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Now, uh, the reason I enjoyed saying those verses out loud, it's not a particularly difficult logic to map out, right? Um, but it's all laid out, right? The first consequences of the nature of the reception of the testimony and then the testimony itself. It's the positive and the negative and it's repeated twice that you might be sure. It's laid out in real black and white terms. You're either in or you're out, alive or dead, slaves to sin or free in righteousness, in the dark or in the light. Those are all scriptural descriptions of the same thing. Now listen, people can clearly be in process, you know, Salvation is not always necessarily occurs to us as a one-time thing. I believe you are either in or you are either out, but I don't even know that we're particularly aware of exactly when that happens. And then if you want to throw in some Calvinism and predestination, we could really go take a left turn and go down a bunny trail that we won't do, um, right? However, with that said, at the end of the day, and I'm talking end of the day, judgment, day. Your name is either in the book of life or it is not, which I thought would actually make for a really creative, interesting movie idea. What if a guy shows up at the pearly gates and Peter's got the book of life and he goes, hang on, there's an asterisk by your name. <laughs> and you're like the one special dude whose name is sort of in there, but there's a catch. Anyways, I don't know. Something that occurred to me today. Now, oddly enough, this was one of the very first memory verses um, I ever did when I was first getting discipled by Creature in 1992. I was a brand new Christian, been a Christian for about a month. And it's interesting because um, it was maybe the most difficult concept for me to, to get this idea that you were either in or that you were out. I didn't seem like that seemed very loving of God because I came from a all roads lead to God kind of uh, the theology there. And which I suppose, um, um, what, what, how do I want to put this? I might be a little bit um, heretical in my thinking on this, I am not completely convinced, let me put it this way, that your salvation is dependent 100% on where you stand here on this earth. Does that make sense? Now that leads people to say, oh, so you think there's a second chance, but that even doesn't work uh, in physics <laughs> that way. What I, what I believe is, is that I believe that our salvation um, is determined in, in eternity. And we are not in, we're in a timeline right here, right? So I think there's more going on than what we see going on around here. And because of that, if somebody dies without me hearing their profession of faith, I'm not completely convinced that they're kaput. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't, I don't even know, like, so I'm not a universalist. Uh, I, 
I just think there's more going on that our, our comprehension of salvation is extremely limited. With that said, I believe in hell. I do. I also believe that at a certain point, your name is in that book or it's not, right? And I think what we study in the book of Joshua backs that up. At a certain space in time, God, like remember, he created a space in Israel, right? And this will be my land. And anybody dwelling in this land will submit to my authority. And you really only had, what was it, two choices if you were a Canaanite? Well, actually, maybe three. <laughs> submit, <laughs> skedaddle out of there, or be destroyed. That was it. Because in heaven, there will be nobody in heaven who has not submitted to God. Otherwise, it ceases to be heaven. Does that make sense? So, to me, this verse rings true. You either receive the Son and have life, or you don't receive the Son and you don't have life. And it works actually even in this era we have right now because we believe that when we have received Christ, we have, have stepped into eternity already, okay? Mm -hmm. Anyways, that's my understanding of it. Maybe it's not perfect or what have you, but that's where I've gotten to thus far in 30 odd years of trying to figure it out mm -hmm. and trying to reconcile a gracious loving God with the idea that nobody's going to be in heaven with us with their sinful nature intact, mm. right? It just can't be. Okay. Uh, and then we can actually stop there before we get to concluding remarks. Does anybody else want to add, Luigi? So, you know, saved or not saved. Right. Right? And then if you're saved, you're on a path of perfectibility. True that. If yeah. you're not saved, you're not on the path. You're just stuck. Yeah, yeah. And perfectibility means change, you know, kaizen, yeah. continuous improvement. Yes. What's kaizen? It's a Japanese word. Oh, okay, good. I was, like, I was like, now that's a biblical term I haven't heard. Yeah. It's Japanese. And what does it mean? Continuous improvement. Continuous improvement. Yeah. And I, I would, I would agree with that. I believe that, I believe that from the bottom of my heart. I believe uh, Ephesians chapter one proves it. Like it's all the benefits and it's all the, um, the gifts that God gives to the believer that pretty negate this idea that you could be stagnant. Like, you know, that if you're, if you're a believer, you're growing. Yeah. And anyway, so I, I agree. Good stuff. Anybody Perfect else? Perfectibility carries into heaven. Yeah. Well, it has to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to repeat that actually for the camera. Uh, his point is this, at the beginning, I mentioned like Gary Stack saying, well, we need to know, are you, do you believe in Christ? Yes or no. Don't blur it. You know, don't deny it. Right. But he also brought up that this um, whole letter really is a response to the temptation of the Gnostics who tried to blur everything. And, oh, don't worry about sin. And there's this, you know, we have this higher knowledge and blah, 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 blah. And John over and over through this book has said, hey, you either confess Christ or you don't. You're right. That's it. Either he came in the flesh or he did not, according to you. Okay. Anyways, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be like, you're right, that could be a really long answer if I were to completely unpack belief and faith. But I will, at least I could give it like a quick overview. The word for belief is pisteo or pistoe or pistis or something like that. It's, it's translated different ways depending on how, it, you know, how it's used in the, the tense and everything. But it, it fundamentally has a sort of to put yourself in the trust of. Um, the idea that you, you trust in, if that makes sense, yeah? Not even so much as a cognitive um, understanding that something is. In other words, the difference is James says even the demons believe and yet, is it perish? What? And, shudder. and shudder. Yeah, I was going to say suffer, shudder, perish. Shudder, right? In other words, they see God. It's not like, it's not like they see God on the throne and go, I don't believe in that. No, they've seen it. <laughs> I've seen that keyboard. I know it exists, right? But belief has something more along the lines of, I, I, I commit myself unto thee, to, to put myself into you in a form of trust, which is like, you know, when we sing that song, wait on the Lord, oh my soul. And I always like to introduce it by saying that word wait doesn't mean be patient. That word wait means I trust you. And so it's, a, and I believe it also has elements of receiving, which would make sense because 
for me to give myself unto thee and is to receive thee. And it's sort of a combining in. Now, because us, the sinner, are sinful, for us, it is a dying to self and a humbling and a coming in under of, such that when it says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that wait, now if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you confess him not is, but as your Lord, that's part of that belief that you have now come under his authority, if that makes sense. His authority, his, his protection. Sorry, that's maybe a little bit longer than even I thought I was going to go on. But it's different than just saying, uh, I believe in this chair. And I got a good answer for that. Kind of, the way God set it up, you know. I think I have an answer for that. Yeah, I think I have an answer for that. And the reason why is because we, because of, we cannot do anything to earn salvation because we're saved by grace and grace alone and the grace is received by faith as a gift anything anything other than just i i receive and i accept the gift is works righteousness i can't be holy enough i can't be good enough i can't do acts of goodness and kindness I mean, what does Paul say? Our best works are but filthy rags. Now, by the way, I know that you know that already, but that's a really foreign concept to most people. They really can't quite grasp that. And, you know, you've heard the story. I've, I've talked to people before as you explain grace and had them say, oh, come on. Like nothing I do counts towards heaven. And what's the answer? No. Correct. Yeah. No, nothing you can do counts and so the only thing that is left then is to receive because that is the only thing that is not a a proactive action but it's a passive reception and belief and i don't know that i've ever used the words proactive and passive in a salvation discussion i got to think about that i'm not sure that i stand by that but okay luigi gave me a thumbs up okay so we got we actually got to wrap this up because now we've only have 15 minutes and we got to wrap it up. okay closing remarks Verse 13, as I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, um, uh, this is interesting because we covered this already. Look what he says. I write these things to you who believe. But remember, he wrote the whole Gospel of John. Um, I, I write that you might believe. So the Gospel of John is evangelical treaties to unbelievers that you might come into faith this book is written to the believers, okay? Okay. Um, yeah, I, to me, also in that little statement, there's a little bit of a whiff of, hey, don't get bogged down what with those so-called enlightened people are telling you to drag you away. Like, stick with the main thing. Remember my gospel, you know? I told you about Christ through my first thing that I wrote. Stick with that, right? And don't listen to these guys. Okay, verse 14 and 15 this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Look, I can narrow this down to really two big concepts right there. The most important part of that is according to his will. Okay. Note the humility built into the concept of asking God for stuff. Um, because it is much of an alignment of our own hearts with him as getting stuff or getting stuff done. Let me explain that. <laughs> if I am praying to God and asking him to do stuff according to his will, I am basically confessing that I just want his will done, not my will done. And therefore, whatever he decides is the very thing that I have just agreed with. So it's, it's really almost more of bringing myself in alignment with what God is already doing than it is so much me asking to do, asking God to do my will. There, that was a bit of a tongue twister. But that's why prayer should give us such great humility, <laughs> which I wrote even in my notes, learning um, things the hard way, like when your daughter doesn't get her room at Grand Canyon University for five months so well i prayed every single day and i thought god was going to answer my prayer back in january 
And he finally did in July. At that point, I was just a puddle of submission. Because <laughs> I had argued and pleaded and shook my little fist at God until I finally was like, I just give up, right? And God's like, okay. And she got a room. And then I found out two weeks later, they ran out of rooms. So, yeah. By the way, just kind of on a topical moment, you know, there was a big event yesterday, the death of Olivia Newton-John. Oh, is that not what you thought I was talking about? <laughs> but Olivia Newton-John dies yesterday. So I'm skimming the paper this morning, and I'm a pastor. So when I see this, because, you know, there's all the how she died, and that, and I'm like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But then I see this, I don't know if you call it a headline, but for the article, right? And it says, Olivia Newton-John made deal with God for her daughter to be healed. And I'd scrolled by it. I'm like, now I got to go check that out. What deal did Olivia Newton-John make? And I had like, you know, a, a cynic with a capital C going into it. Oh, like, you know, Olivia Newton-John, how does Olivia now? But I was kind of pleasantly surprised. The deal Olivia Newton-John made with God was, if you will heal my daughter, I will say the Lord's Prayer every night for the rest of my life. And she says, and so I did. <laughs> No, I'm not. That yeah, uh, yeah, there, there you go. So, wow, do with that as you may. But I was kind of impressed. I'm like, well, Olivia Newton-John said the Lord's Prayer every night. Yeah, anyways, okay. But the most, okay, I said there's two points. The first one is we always pray according to his will, because even prayer when you ask stuff is, is, is humbling of yourself. The second really point I, that you underline, we know that he hears us. Can we just pause for a second and think about how awesome that is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, what an awesome thing it is to consider that the sovereign God of the universe hears us when we humbly submit to him. He hears us. Anyways, that's it. Okay, verses 16 and 17. Where are we? Oh, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. And I'm not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. Now, these are really interesting verses, and I would say this, God, I mean God, John ends his letter with a couple of head scratchers. And not that they're nonsensical, but they're kind of like, why did you choose to put that in? <laughs> At the, like, isn't this supposed to be a summary of your letter? Like, didn't you learn in college, John, <laughs> right? <laughs> That your summary, you summarize what you just said. And he's going all these weird directions. Um, however, he's staying within the context of prayer because he's talking about praying for people, right, that are in sin, right? But um, Barker uh, said this, if love requires the willingness to lay down one's life for a member of the community, then it follows that if one sees a brother commit sin, he is obligated to intercede for him in prayer. So he's saying, pray for our brothers and sisters who sin. Pray about their relationship to sin. But let's be quite honest. Nobody really gives a rip about that in this verse, right? What everybody wants to know is, what is the sin that causes death? Yeah. <laughs> right? Am I right? That's really what everybody really wants to know. What, 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 just while you're on a date, real quickly, remind us, um, what is the sin that leads to death? Just asking for a friend, right? Because isn't that what we all really want to know? Well, just so you know, nobody is really totally sure, okay? We don't really have enough in the context of these verses to say. However, the best answer I got was from John MacArthur, and he says, look, really, from, there's really only two possibilities, one for the believer and one for the unbeliever, Okay. And the sin that leads to death, according to Jesus himself in the book of Mark, regarding the unbeliever, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, for they are guilty of an eternal sin. And all he's really talking about right there is the rejection of the Son, right? So we talked earlier about some will be in, some won't be in. The only unforgivable sin really is to reject the belief, right? Because if belief leads to salvation, is to not come under Christ and not to submit to the will of God. And then uh, MacArthur cited a couple instances where he believes in Scripture 
Christians were taken out of this earth early because of sin, but not losing their salvation. And MacArthur um, reckons Ananias and Sapphira, um, but also when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he said this, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. Now, this is an interesting concept that God in his grace, in his mercy, has a son or a daughter of his, a child of God who is sinning. And I would almost go this, perhaps that sin is negatively impacting people around and God for everybody's benefit but it's an end to it. Because I've known some, a couple of Christians that kind of, I'm convinced of their salvation, but they didn't go out well, right? They didn't go out well. And perhaps that was the mercy of the mercy of God, okay? Both of those views above, by the way, are biblical. We just don't know exactly what John is talking about specifically here in chapter five. That's sort of the best explanation I can come up with with you. Okay, I'm going to keep going because we're so close to being done and we're down to about eight minutes. Okay, verses 18 and 19. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps him safe and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Let me just stop right there. I'm going to skip verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin because we covered that extensively a couple weeks ago. Uh, at the context of that. However, um, what's, the whole, what's the deal with the whole world being under Satan? Well, we got we to gotta clarify that. Don't misunderstand this, that God is somehow impotent against evil, right? No, no, no. God is in full control. However, in our fallen state on this earth, there are two kingdoms operating on earth, right? There's the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God, right? Remember that graphic I showed a couple weeks ago on Sunday morning? There was like the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of you know, earth and how they come together and where they meet is at Christ. And what was fascinating to me is how that graphic works both globally in terms of when we as Christians, when we are obedient to God and when we do God's will here on earth that is the manifestation of God's kingdom on earth but God's also doing the same thing in our heart as he you know slowly um, grows our inner man our inner women our inner woman and and takes over it says what does Paul say our outer man is decaying right but he says our inner man is being renewed daily it is it is growing yeah but the world out there, you know, I don't want to say capital W world, but small W world, that is that is not of the kingdom of God is what he's talking about is under the rule of Satan. OK, in fact, um, the quote from MacArthur was that world, its politics, its economics, its education, its entertainment and above all, even its religion is hostile to God and his family of believers, yeah? And how do we know? What is the litmus test to, to know what kingdom somebody's projecting? Who Jesus is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Boom, okay, we covered that already. Okay, and verse 20, um, we know also that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true even in his son, Jesus Christ, because he is the true and eternal life. Um, this is interesting because it's both an understanding and a personal relationship. The fact that he has come is written in the present tense, meaning he's still here. We, therefore, we know him um, and we're not worshiping some guy from the past. The guy we worship is he who is here with us now. In fact, you remember that a couple days ago, Beekner did a thing about memory. And he said, there's nostalgia. Nostalgia is when you reflect back on the good times. Oh man, remember back in the 80s, I had that super cool car, <laughs> whatever. Like, that's like 70s, 60s, Charlie, sorry. That's nostalgia. 
But Beekner said something was kind of heartbreaking. He said, but when a young widow remembers her departed husband, she remembers not for nostalgia, she remembers to bring him back into her presence. And what he says about Jesus is when we, when we take communion, when we do so in remembrance of me, it is not a nostalgia. It is a manifestation of him and his presence right here now. That's what it means to remember um, Christ. And that's what the context of this is. The Son of God has come. He is, it is in the present tense. He has arrived and is here now. And so this verse obviously is also one last hack at the Gnostics who taught that salvation comes through head knowledge or some secret knowledge that they possessed, right? But John has spent this whole book, this is the better summary, right? He spent this whole book teaching that it is only through the grace of being born again and a rebirth that enlivens us, enlightens us, and quickens a believer into first and foremost knowing, intimately knowing. Um, and by the way, that's a close relation verb, not head knowledge. And from this close relationship, from that comes understanding. The Gnostics were talking about a magical understanding, first and foremost, that you might know God. And God says, no, it's through birth, right? It's much more than just a head knowledge. It is a rebirth. Okay, with like about five minutes left to go, we're going to wrap up with the last verse, which I thought was such a head scratcher. Verse 21, dear children, keep yourself from idols. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're so used to... Pauline endings and say hi to Rasmus and say hi to Cornelius and say hi to da 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 and you know what is what does he always end up with um, oh the grace grace be to you or grace be upon you and da 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 and this like uh, oh by the way dear children keep yourself from idols <laughs> you're like you're like like you know what I actually did I actually did this I I immediately turned over to see what the start of Second John was does he pick up the thought. Like, did he finish the thought? No, it says, dear elder. No, never mind. Yeah, like, what? It's so weird. Okay. In fact, I wasn't alone. Even um, the commentator, Glenn Barker, said, at first glance, it seems out of place. <laughs> Idolatry has not so much as even being mentioned anywhere in the epistle. So at first, um, it seems like he's saying, uh, avoid any contact with paganism. Um, but more likely, this is interesting, it might be one final admonition to avoid the heresy of Gnosticism. So this is what Barker said, and this is all I'm gonna say about it because I, I thought he said it well. False teaching, which is what the Gnostics were doing, right? Is ultimately apostasy from the true faith. To follow after it is to become nothing better than an idol worshiper, especially if it is a matter of the truth of one's conception of God. The author here is being blunt. The false teachers propose not the worship of the true God made known in his son, Jesus Christ, but a false God, an idol they have invented. So, um, so I'll close with these thoughts, and these are just my own thoughts to close. Pagan gods in the Old Testament led people to follow their worst instincts, right? Orgies, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and they were against God, and they led people against God and into sinful lifestyles that worshiped self and pride and lust. And it ultimately was a foul cult of death. Likewise, in our world, we have a, in the world around us, a cult of abandon all morality in favor of personal fulfillment, finding one's own truth, self concerned and this idea that God wants me to be happy and that therefore justifies whatever immoral act I decide to do, right? And John says to us, just as he said to the church at Ephesus 2000 years ago, not you guys, no, no. You have been born again. You come under submission into the obedience of God. And this is not burdensome. This is the way to life and a true eternal life in God's Son. Amen? Amen? Any questions or comments before we wrap up? Well, well didn't, didn't John 
kind of hit on self self indulgence quite a bit. I believe he did. Yeah. Okay. So in self indulgence, who's the idol? You, I <laughs> you, mean, I, me, 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 me is the idol. Yeah, yeah absolutely. In fact, oh, I'm such a. <laughs> that was so me. Talk about an idol to self. You know what I talk about? Like you know, cre creating your own god. You know, I take a little bit from Buddha. I take a little bit from the Book of Hindu. I take a little bit from the Bible and some common sense and. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bobblehead doll, bobblehead doll of me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> Tell me what I ought to do, Lord. I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> Tell me I'm good again, right? Yeah, yeah, it's totally. Who's the best surfer? <laughs> yeah, 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 who's the best surfer? I, 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 am I the best surfer? I, 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 yeah. <laughs> Greg knew me then. Greg and Carrie knew me then. I don't think anybody else here knew, knew, knew Unsaved Dane. No, only Greg and Carrie, yeah. You've stuck by me this whole time. You're like the thief on the cross. I know, they prayed for me before I was a believer. How cool is that, yeah? But what did you say? We'll pray for who? The varmint. The varmint. <laughs> anybody else before we wrap up? All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this night, Lord. I even want to just reflect back the time of worship we had together, Lord. I just really um, just felt super blessed. Perhaps it was knowing that would be our last night together for a few weeks. I just felt really the gift. Um, really, Lord, we, we talk about these concepts, and yet um, they're played out even in this room, and that is our our the love that you have bestowed upon us, which has resulted in our love back to you, but also our love together, Lord. And what we get to create together here in this room on Tuesday nights is the manifestation of you and your love for us. And it's uh, exemplified through the love that we have for each other. So I'm super grateful for this group, Lord, who I will miss over the next few weeks. God, but keep us safe and keep us close to you, Lord, and bring us back together here uh, where we want, might once again, Lord, get deeply into your word and allow you to change us to be, again, Lord, become more like your son because it's, it's his name we want to glorify. So we give glory to his name, Jesus Christ. Amen.